Okay, I'm Ed Lee, as most of you know. I'm the director of the IP program. I'm also a co-director of Chicago Kent Center for Design, Law, and Technology. Uh, and I have the great pleasure today of moderating this conversation with an internationally recognized designer, uh, Felicia Ferrone. And I will provide just a brief uh, biography of her impressive credentials before getting into our uh, conversation about design. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ferrone was born in Chicago. She was a native Chicagoan. She graduated with a degree in architecture from Miami University in Ohio. And afterwards, uh, I should say, she graduated with a degree in architecture uh, from Miami University. And then afterwards, uh, practice as an architect in Milan, Italy, uh, where she also uh, worked in a series of positions with some of Italy's most notable design luminaries, including Antonio Citerio and Piero Lissoni. Uh, now, uh, starting in 2010, she founded her international namesake brand, Ferrone, uh, which is based in Chicago and also Milan. Uh, in addition to her brand, uh, she also does commissioned work with uh, companies uh, such as uh, Boffy, Other, the McCollin Volume Gallery, among others. Uh, in addition to her design work, she also is in academia. She is the Director of Graduate Studies in, in Industrial Design and a clinical assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, she previously was a lecturer at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago for many years. Uh, her award-winning work is also included in the permanent collection at the Arts Institute of Chicago, uh, and she is also a recipient of a Good Design Award. Her designs are widely uh, exhibited and published around the world. Uh, if you go to her website, you can see that her designs uh, are published in magazines, uh, design magazines, and other magazines internationally. And it's a quite impressive body of work. Uh, so I really am looking forward to uh, picking her brain about the creative process and what she does. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's get right down to the conversation. Let's start first with this uh, degree in architecture. Uh, so you worked as an architect in Milan. Uh, was there something about being an architect that gave you the experience or knowledge to become an industrial designer? Hmm. I think architecture, the one thing I find quite fascinating about it is that it teaches you to think dynamically on all scales because in architecture you're taught to think on an urban scale all the way down to a construction detail. And so for me, I guess I, um, you know, I think design is very much of a dynamic scale as well. And in architecture you're also, um, you know, you have to consider context. You know, how a building fits into the streetscape and the city, et cetera. Um, and so I also I very much approach design that way. You know, if it's a, a, a table or something, it's, it's sort of you have to consider, you know, what the context would be, how you, from which direction would you approach it potentially. Um, and so I, I think because of my background in architecture, I, I think sort of in that way regarding all of my designs. And when you became an architect, did you think down the road maybe you mm. would focus more on the design aspect? Or was it something that eventually you came to that recognition? So I actually didn't, the whole time I was studying architecture, I didn't know that uh, design existed as a field. Um, yet I found myself sketching little things here and there, but no one ever kind of looked over my shoulder and said, hey, by the way, that's actually a field you could study. So it wasn't until I moved to Milan right after graduation, uh, which is still today the capital of design, that I sort of discovered this whole world. It sort of unfolded before my eyes, um, both in where I was working. Again, I ended up working for one of the most known Italian designers and didn't know he was a designer because he had an architecture firm. That's kind of how I knew him. 
And, um, and then with the Furniture Fair, which is every April, it's a week-long um, design show that spreads throughout the entire city even, that um, it was sort of there that I sort of really kind of discovered it. But from that moment, you know, fast forward, I would say, you know, 15, a good solid 15 years before I sort of ended up in it, in the field of design, which was about 2010. So um, it was a, a slow, slow move towards that. And my work, the studios I was working in, it sort of went from really large scale, um, like, you know, really large buildings, and then it, with each new sort of uh, position I took, the scale of what I was working on got smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, and then for the students that you teach, do you encourage them to take classes in architecture? Have, have you I do, included? I, I do think about that a lot, you know, because it's, it's, I am a self-taught designer, and, you know, looking at teaching design versus my background and how I think about it. So I, I really try to um, not so much um, encourage them taking courses in that per se, but really kind of look at things in this dynamic context. Um, you know, and really think about an object not in a vacuum of space, you know, in a computer rendering or something like that, but really consider it in its context. And, you know, of course, UIC is very focused on user-centric design. So the needs of the users and how a person would interact with um, the object you're, you're designing, so. Okay, and, and we'll get into some of those mm -hmm. factors when we discuss mm -hmm. the design process. Uh, now you spend time in Milan and you spend time in Chicago. Can you describe the sort of the benefits for designers being in those two cities? Mm -hmm. So Milan is the end all be all sort of in many ways uh, for design, of course. So um, it's sort of the, yeah, the pinnacle of that. Chicago, um, Obviously, it has a rich, rich history, both in architecture as well as design, as you at IIT well know. Um, and what I found kind of ending up back here um, is that I think the breadth and depth of design education here is probably none other um, compared to other cities in the US, if not the world, um, on, many, um, on many levels. And I think the, the interesting thing that most people don't know is the majority of high-end custom furniture and small batch is actually produced here in the city of Chicago. But no one knows that. Um, and so it actually offers all sorts of rich opportunities for manufacturing here. They're just, we're just, we just, because we're Chicago and I think very often kind of humble and just nose to the grindstone working, we don't sort of broadcast all that. But it's actually a great city for design. So that Getting this, things done. this two city arrangement is ideal for your creativity or design work. Get it is, yeah, it is. And it's also just sort of a, a, a great sort of personal honor that I've been able to cause sort of have a little piece of my own Milan because it was such a formidable experience for me and completely altered who I am as a person, both as a human and a designer, I think. Okay. Terrific. So let's shift now to the design process. This is uh, sort of the heart of the matter and trying to understand what you do. Uh, first, in terms of conceiving ideas for designs, um, who or what are your design inspirations? What sort of gives you the mm. inspiration to come up with all the amazing designs that mm. you do? So a lot of times it, it, the work kind of comes from um, it's, I would say it's conceptually driven, like an idea pops into my head sort of and then I go about trying to develop it. So it, it could be sort of um, trying to express a singular idea um, or create a system or um, sort of uh, really look at, a lot of my work centers around sort of challenging archetypes. So these uh, general concepts obviously that we have in our mind and how do you sort of reframe it and, and sort of flip it in many ways. So I would say a lot of the work is sort of um, in, in these different aspects. And some of it's also, you know, I can be inspired by, you know, a manhole cover on the street as I'm biking by or something. You know, it's, it's really, it comes from anywhere and everywhere. So when you talked about, you know, sort of changing archetypes, mm -hmm. is it that you're experiencing things in your environment and then you're thinking, oh, I could, do something differently with that? Or? Right, a lot of it's um, kind of 
looking at patterns, so I do a lot of precedent studies, and that I think also comes from my architecture background as a method. So um, it's really kind of look, trying to find patterns and then find what's not being done, basically. Okay. And what, what did you describe it as? as? What kind of study? Like a precedent study. A precedent study. Mm -hmm. So everything that came before it. Oh, interesting. In that typological way. So you get a lot of, essentially you're accumulating data and you're trying to figure mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. here's, mm -hmm. the, here's the new space that right. Right. Is, is needed. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, another question I have relates to how you think design affects the different senses. And obviously design is a very visual mm, mm -hmm. concept, especially in the way the United States design patent uh, statute focuses on the visual. Uh, but how important, how, how important are the other senses, such as touch, smell? Um, I don't know if taste enters into mm -hmm. your glassware as well. Mm -hmm. But are you consciously thinking of how this material or how this design will affect other senses beyond the visual? Mm -hmm. I do think a lot about texture when it comes to um, perhaps designs in the furnishing realm, um, furnishing lighting and, and some objects. Um, I do think about it a lot as, as far as that. So the visual and uh, if there's some uh, textural tactility aspect to it that sort of enhances it. Um, enhances the experience. Uh, when it comes to the glassware, it sort of depends. Um, some are, I approach in a much more um, conceptual way, and it's sort of then um, realizing uh, the designs to uh, completely support the concept and vice versa. Um, I did design a glass for the Macallan. Are any scotch drinkers out there? Um, <laughs> So I designed a glass uh, when they launched the rare cask a number of years ago. And um, that was really kind of um, the first time I really uh, sort of dug into what it means to make a, like a proper glass for uh, scotch tasting. And um, so the glass really kind of came out of that research and those uh, needs to enhance the flavors and the aromas. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and then to not warm the whiskey also by your body temperature. Okay, and, and the part that relate, enhances the aromas and flavors, does mm -hmm. that relate to the material that you're using? Uh, in that case, it's more formal. So, so the, the glass sort of um, towards the aperture actually curves in because then it concentrates the aroma and because of the high alcohol content, you actually don't need to agitate it to uh, release the aromas like you do in a wine. You actually just hold the glass just below your lower lip and then allow the aromas to concentrate up into your, into your nose. So um, the glass sort of does that. It, it sort of allows it to concentrate. And then um, because of the way it's designed, it's sort of the, the bottom is raised. Um, so there's sort of a an empty bottom, let's say. So you can hold the glass there, and then because of the way it's designed with this, this sort of raised bottom, uh, your body temperature, if you hold the bottom um, band, the, the, your body temperature won't raise the glass temperature beyond above that sort of bottom. Okay, and that sounds like it involves <laughs> science, right? Where, it's more, <laughs> I mean, it's sort of like taking a lot of, I, I take in a lot of information and sort of, um, intuitively approach it. I would never say necessarily science in this kind of case, but it's, it's sort of um, looking at these aspects, these human aspects. Okay, terrific. Mm -hmm. Now we've asked you to walk us through several of your designs, mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to show it to the audience here. So this first <laughs> one is called Revolution Collection, uh, and it looks amazing, first of all. Uh, so uh, just walk us through, you know, sort of from conception to the the design process and mm -hmm. how you decided that when you were finished with mm. the product. Right. Yeah. So uh, this was actually my very first collection that I designed when I was still living in Milan in the early years. Um, the, the concept was, um, in Italy, as you may know, you know, you can imagine the large tables full of friends and food and drinks and everything. And at the end of these, uh, big dinners, there would just be in what my mind, in my mind was sort of this visual chaos of three million different height glasses and things. So 
being an architect and, and somewhat obsessed with you know modernism and datum, so continual horizon lines and things. So this glassware collection uh, I sort of developed. So it's it's creating a system of objects, and you can see sort of their repeating proportions that work like the bowl on the far right is the the total height is the height of the long, the deeper end of the next one over, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's, that's how it becomes the system. And then also it sort of cleans up the tablescape. And it also redefines it in a way that also all the elements in the glassware become a graphic representation. So even if you have just a sip or two in a glass, you still have that really colorful band of, of liquid sort of enhancing also its, its presence and adding to sort of the design effect. Um, and then the, the idea was it started with this idea of the same unit being, so it's a one-third, two-thirds proportion, and uh, sort of having the same unit but flipped, so you had sort of the small side up on one, at one place sitting in the other glass, the long side up, so it sort of all did this like wine and water uh, inverse proportion in many ways. And then the system sort of developed out of there. And I take it that's very unusual to think of glassware as a system of different size and oriented pieces. It is in this way. I mean, obviously we know there's, you know, a different out sizes and wine, you know, sort of general um, dimensions and things like that. But I think something in this way that is so systemic I think that is still, um, to this day, I don't know of another uh, one that sort of addresses the same issues. And what's the significance of revolution? Uh, so it is because of this idea of it, it sort of turns, oh, okay. you know, but then also it is sort of this idea of like it's, it's completely new in many ways. Because also it, it challenges the idea in addition to what is a stem, like stemware, right? What is a stem? Can the two be, you know, in this case, the two becomes the stem as opposed to the classic, again, sort of archetypal um, mushroom, you know, inverted mushroom-like base. Okay, terrific. Importantly, where do people buy your work? Uh, <laughs> so online? mostly on my site is probably easiest. Okay. Um, we do everything here in Chicago, actually. Um, so my warehouse and design studio is oh. on the north side. Albany Park, anyone from know where that is? There's one little, <laughs> couple hands. <laughs> Albany, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great, it's local then. Yeah, it's local very local. Source. So all the glassware is actually handmade in the Czech Republic. And um, because of the double-ended nature of most, most all of the work, it can't be made with a mold, because there's no attachment point. And so each one is literally made one by one. And so it's, it's really, I, I've been fortunate to find a, just an absolutely masterful um, craftsmen. Yeah, I mean, they're so beautiful. Okay, let's go to the second mm -hmm. one, which is called Rare Glasses. So this is the one I was um, referring to that was designed for the Rare Cask, hence its name. And uh, you can see it's sort of um, the aperture as it gets tighter, and then you see that lower band that you would hold then, and then that raised bottom, again, the, the heat won't transfer beyond that midpoint. The same thing with the Revolution Collection is that it also works really well with like hot liquids. You can actually hold the glass at the bottom and it's perfectly room temperature. But then the top part of the glass where you have the hot liquids will be scalding hot like any glass liquid. I mean, glass holding a hot liquid. So, um, uh, and the, so yeah, this is, sort of the one that really addresses sort of taste and is a real technical sort of glass. Okay, and do you recall how this was inspired? You were drinking scotch and thought, oh, this <laughs> no, that's a good question. needs so, to be. No, actually, they, um, the, the McAllen, I ended up through an intermediary party, had approached me saying, oh, McAllen wants to do this like four city tour to launch the rare cask, and um, they'd like you to be involved in this ancillary way, like having, sort of installations so people who were there that night tasting the rare cask could have other things to view and interact with and stuff. And then sort of the, the notion of, well, they'd probably need a glass to taste the rare cask. So they had originally wanted something from the Revolution collection, and I had said, you know, it's so sort of 
it's so sort of iconic for me. You need something that's you because this is so heavily associated with me. It was my first collection. It's been so widely published as part of the Art Institute's collection. You know, I'm like, you really kind of need your own thing. So, but because they love that, obviously, it's sort of very much inspired from that. So, and this was something that they had this crazy tight, incredibly tight deadline, and they either needed like 3,000 pieces, it's some huge quantity, and I had literally like a day to design it, they approved it, we didn't even have a chance to prototype wow. it. I just sent the stuff to the factory and I was like, go, 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 and because <laughs> I already had um, a shipment ready to leave like that following Friday, we just like, they got the stuff done, tucked it on, and off it went, and then it, you know, it all showed up for the first time in hand like, for the event, so it was this crazy, normally doesn't happen quite like that, but. You know, is there a normal time that, it, how much it takes you to design a new product? It depends, I, I, I would say I, I can design pretty quickly, but that's because of, you know, my decades of experience. Um, I'm quite fast about it, and I can nail proportions. Uh, they're usually pretty right on. I mean, I do, you know, if you open my computer files, it's like this whole mess of like me trying stuff. But a lot of times it's, you know, it, it's either sort of that or, um, you know, I'll make a thing and I'm like, nah, we'll play around with a couple, like I'll play around with a couple dimensions and then, you know, that's kind of it and stuff. But again, that goes back to years of experience doing architectural work where everything was so about proportion. So I've sort of trained my eye over the years. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the third example. Mm -hmm. This one seems different from a lot of your other work. So why don't you walk us through this one, Bottle yes. Project. So this, this Bottle Project, um, I was approached by the magazine uh, Food and Wine. They were, um, had reached out to a, you know, a bunch of artists and chefs and designers to uh, just kind of for a fun thing in the magazine. And the, and the, the sort of brief design brief was reinvent the archetypal wine bottle is what they, they was proposed. So I, I went about my usual looking at precedent studies, every wine bottle, you know, the history of wine bottles and bottle making and um, because as I mentioned earlier, I always very often try to look for the pattern and do the, find what's always being done and then flip it if I can. So um, I was getting really close to the due date and um, just couldn't quite find a way to flip it um, and then, you know, I'm sure one morning, like brushing my teeth, I was like, oh, that's it. Um, where I realized the, the neck and the aperture of the bottle is always, if you look down from the top, it's always um, perfectly centered in the vessel. So everything's perfectly concentric. And so I was like, ah, oh, if you shift it, and so I made a quick little sketch, and then in rendering it, we re realized if you basically made the aperture tangential, tangential on one side of the, whatever the circumference is of the, the vessel part, that it, it created this asymmetrical shape. And then through that, it actually, um, once you've, you've kind of made that move, it opens up all these opportunities. So one, it's sort of the shift sort of indicates to the user almost where to hold it and how you use it in a way. Um, it starts to be directional. Um, and then to that, if you notice, you know, if you walk into a wine store, or the wine section of a grocery store, the labels you'll notice are getting louder and louder and louder graphically because they're so desperate to capture your attention. And so um, because they're, they're basically, I mean, they're sort of the three typical uh, wine bottles, but the labels are all the same, vertical rectangles, right? And so with this, it opens up actual infinite visual branding opportunities. You could have a label that works down the straight wall of the, of the bottle, or you could have a crest on sort of the shoulder, or you could have something that wraps all the way around. So it really opens up you know, every bottle, and also you, then it would be positioned differently on the shelf depending on how it's labeled. Um, and so um, it really opens up um, individuality back into the design market of the wine industry that is so um, completely dense. And then once this was all sort of discovered, then there was the discovery of the nesting. And so through the nesting, you're actually able to save about 50% of the space in storage, in boxing, which then translates to carbon footprint, if you extrapolate, in shipping. Because the you're actually able to put 
the two bottles together in the space of normally they, they you know, they're designed to not go together clearly, right, because of um, the way the bottles are. So, um, and this was something I worked with Dunstan very, very closely with, um, both through the design patent stages as well as the utility patent, which thanks to Dunstan's pushing and insistence with the office, um, we finally secured the utility patent this August, I think, which was for the nesting specifically. The design patents were on the overall um, shape of the bottle. And, and is the goal for this bottle that wineries would mm. adopt it, or is it consumers would uh, mm. use it? Right, right, like it. a consumer product. No, it really is meant to, you know, if I had my magic wand, it would really, um, every bottle in the world for the most part would adopt this form because of its, its space saving opportunities with such a simple shift, right? Um, and so the idea is that everything would sort of move to that. Um, I am trying to figure out sort of next steps with it as far as, you know, do I try to produce it and then have people buy, you know, wineries produce, mm -hmm. you know, pallets and cases and whatever. Um, or do I, you know, license it and these kinds of things. But the idea is that it is sort of adopted. I don't want it to be sort of um, a, a niche product in a way that it's sort of a specialty bottle. I really, you know, my desire is for things to really kind of be everyday, even though perhaps they don't look like everyday objects, but to really sort of um, work its way into the, our system, our current system. Have you received reaction from people in the wine industry? I haven't done a lot with this actually yes, yet. I, I was kind of waiting um, for sort of the patents to come through so that I could put stuff out there. Um, so that's sort of the next step of like, how do I do that? Um, you know, and, and it does, there are some issues where, because with current bottling, everything's concentric, so it's very easy to fill, right? Because you just give a, you know, a, whatever the spacing is between the bottles, right? And you just say, every three inches, you drop in X amount of liquid. Obviously with this, because they're on these conveyors, it has the possibility to, to rotate. So there would be having to be some indexing, some key sort of in the bottom so that, you know, so it, it, it does have some aspects that have to be sort of addressed either by the bottle or, or by production to sort of allow it to adapt to something so seamless. Okay, so you mentioned in, in this uh, bottle design, the sort of concern for the carbon footprint. Mm. Uh, it seems like these days sustainability is a big issue mm -hmm. in a lot of different in industries. How conscious are you of sustainability issues in terms of your designs? Mm. I, I mean, to me, both as a designer as well as an academic, I kind of feel like that's just, like, it should be like involuntary muscles to all of us at this point. Like, I, I just feel like, it's unconscionable that people don't consider it, but in a truly meaningful way and not in a superficial way in which most things are sort of this like band-aid marketing, it's you know, environmental. Um, obviously with glass, it's, it's got an infinite lifespan. Um, so, you know, and I, the other way I sort of um, think about it is um, attachment, like attachment theory in many ways. Um, I believe in really designing things that people have an emotional response to because then you will want to live with something for a long time. And um, a lot of my work also has is sort of multifunctional in a way. Um, and because the idea is the longer someone, you know, has an object in their home that they're interacting with, the more memories sort of get associated with that object. And therefore, you're less likely to ever want to get rid of it. And I also believe that if it's designed with a certain quality to it, um, that it will never end up in a landfill. Like if you take any of the great chairs that you might see in some museum, you know that piece will never ever end up in a landfill. Therefore, it's the most sustainable. Because even if you put it out on the sidewalk, you know, you know someone will snag it in 10 minutes, it'll be gone. And so I believe true quality design is inherently sustainable, as long as obviously the materials aren't like off-gassing something awful and toxic. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> uh, a couple other factors that uh, I've, I've read or heard are sort of being debated in terms of their relevance to design are accessibility, you mm. know, sort of accessibility mm -hmm. uh, in particular for those individuals with disabilities. 
uh, and also more recently, um, gender issues mm. with design. Mm -hmm. uh, could you speak to you know, mm -hmm. those as factors for designers to consider? What's the direction and are those factors, things that uh, animate your design as well? Mm. I mean, I do think it's, depending on what's being designed, I think it could be absolutely critical these aspects or less so. Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, with disability, like everyone knows the company OXO with the big handles, which was developed out of, you know, issues with arthritis and dexterity and things. So, you know, with glassware, it is sort of um, a question of diameters, you know, at, at times. So, you know, I, I don't know that my work necessarily addresses those issues per se. As far as gender issues, um, I, you know, I, I think a lot of, I, I've, I've been so influenced by, you know, the modernists from the 20s and, and things. I think a lot of times my work can sort of be masculine, but then there are other parts of it on the other end of the spectrum that are, I would say, sort of very feminine in a way. So it is sort of um, both of these. And it's interesting because when I originally did the um, Revolution collection, I noticed the majority of my clients were men. And I think because there were so few glassware opportunities for men. You know, they were all tended to be very flowery and Vera Wang and, you know, in, a, in a, something that was a very traditional female sort of aesthetic. And so I think this off, offered opportunities for something that was sort of less gendered in a way. Um, so, you know, it's something we kind of talk about at school, of course. Um, I think, you know, obviously my body of work just kind of comes from me, so it's, it's what it is because it's all self-generated, um, the majority of it. Okay. Uh, to speak more generally about your mm -hmm. uh, design style, I, I grabbed this from your website, I believe, uh, this line. Uh, European influences, minimalist aesthetics, mastery of proportion, which you've emphasized mm -hmm. before, and meticul meticulously considered details mm -hmm. are the hallmarks of Furoni. Mm -hmm. Is that the essence of your design I, style? Yeah, I would say it's always kind of hard to, it, it, you know, I, I feel like that's ever evolving. Like I'm like, oh, that's why I do this or, you know. Um, but yes, I mean, I think about, you know, the, the really paying attention to detail, I think again comes from architecture and, you know, it's everything. I, I really believe in like total design. So it's not just the glass, it's, you know, the packaging of course, you know, it's really all these aspects and consideration and, you know, down to the logo or the sticker we place on the glass saying it's handmade in the Czech Republic and the logo, you know, just everything about it. So, um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite a perfectionist. I used to dance and so I have this, I'm not into the wabi-sabi, like it's wonderful that it's kind of rough and loose. Mm -mm. Like I want it to be like, Perfect, <laughs> as perfect as something can be. So, um, I think that's what I'm always sort of striving for. And I, you know, like I mentioned with Milan, it's really where I discovered design, and and I, you know, am able to do what I do now because I was just living it and experiencing it and reading about it and all these designers and history of des and teaching design. Obviously, um, I do a lot. I have my students always, almost no matter what course I'm teaching, have them do presentations on on important contemporary and, and um, uh, historical figures in design to really kind of break down what the pieces are and how they work. So I think very much in terms of the work doesn't necessarily look like their work, but it's, it's sort of considered in this state. Yeah, I could tell you were perfectionist when you tweaked <laughs> my uh, PowerPoint slides for today's presentation. Sorry. <laughs> so that's when I knew that uh, you were a perfectionist. But also, I mean, that also, I think, indicated me that you're a designer. I yes, mean, you, no, absolutely. You knew the proportion, you knew the scale. Right. And Occupational hazard, like yes, tweaking absolutely. Tweaking it. So. No, they look great now after your uh, revision. Um, I guess my reaction to your design, which I think they're so beautiful, uh, I would say they're exquisite, but in a very modern way. Mm. You know, they're, they're, like the attention to detail is, is, I mean, that's palpable. And there is this sort of sleek, modern mm -hmm. feel to it. Mm -hmm. It just has a certain wow factor to me. When mm -hmm. you look at it, it's just like, oh, you know, something, mm -hmm. you know, to mm -hmm. be impressed by. And uh, that's how I would characterize it. It's exquisite, but not exquisite in an ornate, older, mm -hmm. classical sense, mm -hmm. but in a modern mm -hmm. sense. I mm -hmm. don't know if you, you agree with that characterization? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my work is very contemporary. Um, 
I am not a nostalgic person, um, just as a human. Um, you know, I do look at his, you know, I, I do look at history of design, and I love flea markets and eBay. Like, I love looking at sort of again this idea of precedent studies and um, things that used to, like typologies that don't exist anymore. So I, I very much look and love sort of following rabbit holes down eBay of you know typologies of things. Um, so, but my work is not ever meant to be nostalgic. Um, and people, it's interesting because some of the collections, you know, when I, when I exhibit and things, people will often say there's something kind of reminiscent of, of something that's sort of historic or mid-century or kind of 40s, but, but they're like, but it's not that. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely that. And in fact, it's interesting, especially with the Revolution collection, it's used so often in movies that are sci-fi, like Westworld and Star Wars and... Alien, the Covenant, and all these kinds of things, and I think set dress, set um, decorators and designers really look at this work as um, stuff that really speaks to a future. And again, because it's not linked to such a um, message, meaning carrying archetype, it's allowed to be set into you know some spaceship or something that's set a hundred years from now. And so, you know, I think that speaks to the contemporary of it's not of a time period. And I also truly believe, again, that idea of, like, connecting to objects emotionally and for long times. I do believe in timelessness. Wonderful. Okay, so let's turn to our last topic, uh, which uh, probably uh, my design law class will be interested in uh, especially, is the, the, the law side of it, legal protection for designs. How important for your designs uh, is, and then you have your lawyer here with <laughs> you right. too, Dunstan Barnes. Uh, how important is it for you to get design protection for your designs? Do you get it for all of your designs, some mm. of them? Uh, mm -hmm. What is the strategy for uh, your designs? So, um, one of my favorite topics, actually. So, the bottle I did pursue uh, protection on because it is a mass market. I envision it as a mass market product. What I do is very niche. And so, I think to go to the extent, would I even be able to get coverage? It, I don't know that it makes sense because, in the end, it's expensive. Um, I have had lots of well, I have tried to um, actually get some other glassware, which I'm actually not showing today, uh, copyrighted. And Dunstan pushed and pushed and pushed. And ultimately, they came back and said the issue of, in, of separability, separability. Um, didn't work. Apparently now, perhaps, with the cheerleader thing that you all know about, um, there may be some glimmer of hope, perhaps. But um, Again, it would have to be really cost effective. I do, however, um, have this issue on occasion. Um, uh, and it's actually, I have something where hopefully we're sending off the letter tomorrow um, to someone in Italy um, through an Italian attorney because it's all happening in Milan, where someone who absolutely 100%, it is my glass, um, with the vessel just being a different angle. Um, and so this is something that, you know, will wake me up at 3 a.m. with anxiety because my heart and soul and everything is in my work. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's me. You know, every, every element of me is, is in it. So it's, it's something that, um, and I think it's really, I, I think it's, you know, it's like in academia. You know what plagiarism is. It's, there's a very clear definition. Um, and I feel like as a designer, you know when something's too close. Okay, could we, could we speak yeah. a little bit more about that? Um, in terms of the professional ethics or norms for designers, mm -hmm. uh, are there rules of thumb? Are mm. there sort of guidelines, principles that help mm -hmm. uh, decide if you've sort of borrowed too much mm -hmm. from another uh, product mm -hmm. design? I think everyone knows. I think, because I think, you know, you can accidentally end up with someone, some, something, as you all know, that's just like someone else's, even if you haven't seen theirs. And it's a gut thing. You just know that it's too close. Um, honestly, I don't, I, ideas are infinite. We, there's just no end to ideas. And I, you know, I often say, stay in bed that day. 
if you're not going to do something new, just stay in bed. The world is better off. <laughs> you know, we don't need to, we don't need to race, waste the resources. We do not need more product. This is true of any field. Stay in bed. So, you know, I, I just feel like, you know, so often you see it in, in you know, it's like in anything, right? You've got the, the hot couture version that trickles down into the fast fashion. This is true of every field, be it cars or design or whatever. And you just know what they're looking at. And so as a designer, I just feel like it's so, in many ways, I feel like it's, it's very clear. Um, because it's one thing to take inspiration and do something original with it. And that's, I'm all for that. But it shouldn't be like, oh, I've seen that. <laughs> You know, I mean, and again, it goes back to plagiarism and writing. You know, there are very clear rules for that. And I, I, I wish it were sort of as, as clear, um, because it's, it's, to me, it's just blatant. You can, you can tell when, when it's a copy versus something that was inspired by, and then they added their twist to it, which I'm all for. And have you faced a lot of copying problems of your, you know, others copying your works? I, I have. It feels like more recently, even now that I have kind of moved stuff to Milan, I feel like in some ways. Um, yeah, I, I do because um, I think what I've been doing and because of how I view design as being like being always at that leading edge. Um, and I'm an academic, so I teach, you know, I, you know, this is my life. And, and um, I think sort of what I pursue, again, of really studying history and the greats and all this kind of stuff, that, that influences the type of work I do. And so I, I do feel like I can see other people's, and I was like, they're looking at this. Because especially with the, with the glassware in specific, no one was doing glassware really in this type of material and in these types of forms. And so it's really easy to see when something is inspired. Um, uh, just because no one's, and still to this day, I'm sort of, you know, the reason I get a lot of press um, is because of the, you know, the way I consider it and the, the way the pieces come out and the concepts behind them and the materiality and the proportions and the imagery and things. Um, and no one else is sort of, you know, I, I sort of have a little moat in some ways, um, and I'm very kind of known for that. Um, and so again, it's, it, it speaks to, I think it's easier to tell you know, and again, it's not my material. You know, I don't own borosilicate material. Um, but I would just hope that someone, just like I come up with new stuff, that they would come up with new stuff that's wholly fresh. Yeah, so it's a combination of the material and the design, and others yeah. are trying to yeah, copy it. Right. If I have to come up with new ideas for my own line, you know, why can't, you know, we should all be able to do it. Everyone else. I have just one last question, and then we're going to open it up to the audience for questions. And this sort of relates back to the second part of our discussion and your sort of design process. Uh, and it was intriguing to me that you have this uh, precedent survey uh, mm -hmm. of past designs. Do you worry about the role of artificial intelligence in design? You know, the, the, the possibility that AI will be doing these precedent studies of all the you know, designs in a database and coming up with something that's new, uh, you know, tweaking it and kind of replacing designers? Hmm. I haven't, is, that's interesting. No, I don't think, I think at the end of the day, the, probably the reason I, was, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it is because I don't. I think there, there are too many soft tissue-y kind of things involved in good design. You know, the, the human aspects, how, in, how a human interacts with an object and opens it up and how it feels and the weight and the temperature and, you know, all these kinds of things that I just don't think we'll be able to get to in a foreseeable, even distant future in many ways. So, you know, and I think, you know, if they're looking at data to make designs, I think very often it just comes down to nothing will be poetic. You know, I, I think it'll be perfect, but in a way that's like the perfect average of the diameter that this needs to be. You know, like I, I just don't think it'll be soulful in a way. Um, yeah. It'll be too much of a machine. Too much of a machine, right. I, I don't think it'll be, you know, I actually don't consider my work art necessarily, but to use that terminology, I just don't think it will be artful. And, and, and that emotion of standing in front of a painting or a photo or, you know, an object or something that just makes, just does something in your soul, you know? Yeah. 
Another term that I hear designers use is empathy. That they, they design for empathy. Right. You know, they right, absolutely. And I think, you know, there's there are all these factors that you have to take into consideration beyond sort of ergonomics and and you know, designing with empathy as a tool. There are just too many, I think, really for AI to to be able to get there. Okay, that's reassuring. <laughs> Okay, well, why don't you please join me in thanking uh, Felicia Ferrone for spending this hour with us. Fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. It's been a pleasure to be here.